on the Mayfly bench modding this build your own clone analog delay pedal. So I built this pedal for myself because I like delay. And this thing sounds really, really good. So one problem I noticed about it though is that when you have the effect on, it's just a little quieter, or it seems that way anyway, than when it would be with the effect off. In my perfect world, I want to step on this for guitar solos and have it be a little louder. This video is all about how to achieve that. It's DIY, man. You should be able to just mod it, you know? And this is the schematic for the Build Your Own Clone Analog Delay Line. It's a fairly complicated for a pedal, but let's have a look at it because it's kind of cool. So we've got our input jack going through a buffer, going through a little bit of EQ. This goes into the delay circuitry. The output of the delay circuitry comes over here, and the clean path comes over here. And this is a little summing mixer and buffer and a little bit of EQ too, and then it goes out. So right now I'm going to describe how this part of the circuitry works. Not because it's important for what we want to do to the pedal itself, but just because it's cool. So I'll post down somewhere on the screen where to jump to if you don't want to hear a description about how this delay circuitry works. The delay circuitry starts with this 571 integrated circuit. This guy is called a dual compander. It's got two channels, and either channel could be set up for compression or expansion. And what they're doing is the input comes in here and it is compressed and then sent back out over into this delay line over here. Now the output of the delay line, it goes through some EQ over here, gets stuffed back into the, into the chip and it is expanded. And it comes out over here. And then you can vary the level of that, of the effect that gets uh, mixed in with the dry signal. There's also another potentiometer here to uh, mix in some of the delayed signal so it gets re-affected, so you get your uh, repeats of your echo. Now why you need this is because of this delay chip. It's called a switch capacitor delay line, or a bucket brigade device. What this chip has in it is 4,094, or 95, capacitors, all switched back and forth. There's a big, long line of them in there, coming from the input here and going to the two outputs over there. And what happens is the charge on a capacitor gets switched or moved to the next one in the chain on alternating clock pulses from, uh, let's see here, from this input here and this input here, ticking charge from one capacitor to the next. So what that means is that signal coming over here gets put on the first capacitor, and when the clock ticks, that signal gets moved to the next capacitor and the next and the next and the next and the next and the next. And sometime later, it comes out of these two outputs. It's analog, but it still is a sampling device. So that's kind of neat. Now the speed of the sampling is all based on the clock being generated over here. And that is controlled by your delay control, which is on the top panel of the effect. Give it a longer delay, the clock slows down, and the charge going through this uh, line of capacitors gets slower. Reduce the delay, clock ticks faster, the charge goes through there a little faster. Now the thing about bucket brigade devices is the capacitors inside this chip are only so large. So you have to do a bunch of careful shaping of your signal in order to make it so this chip is not overwhelmed. Hence the compander chip over here. Now the cool thing about this sort of circuitry is that when you turn the delay control, it changes the clock in real time. And that means that the signal is being pulled out of this delay chip, initially recorded at a different clock rate than they are when you're being pulled out right now. That creates the funky pitch shifting effects that you hear when you turn this knob. So that's kind of neat. Uh, as I mentioned before, from there, the delayed signal comes through here and then out the door to this mixing bus right there. This compander is one of the reasons why analog effects sound the way they do, a little bit lo-fi. That and the fact that the frequency response of this delay line changes 
depending on how you set the delay, because the rate at which you're sampling changes. So the input signal comes in here, goes to this buffer. This just lowers the impedance into the input of this load circuit right here. So this is just a, uh, a typical inverting op amp circuit. And the way these work is that the gain of this guy is equal to the value of the feedback resistor divided by the value of the input resistor. So we have 47K divided by 47K, which is one. So this is a, a unity gain inverting amplifier. But wait, we've got some uh, components right here. We've got a capacitor in series with a 10K resistor. When the signal goes up in frequency, eventually this capacitor starts conducting. And when it does, then this 10K resistor starts being in parallel with this 47K resistor. This changes the input resistor of this op amp and it lowers it dramatically. So you get a step in the frequency response. This is a shelving filter. So at a certain frequency, the gain goes up quite dramatically. I suspect why this is here is just to control the base response of the signals going through here so this uh, the capacitors inside here are not overwhelmed with too much signal. Now if you look over here, it has the same filter, in fact the same 10K and 0.0068 capacitor, but this time they're in the feedback path. This implements the same filter, but in reverse. This is another shelving filter, but it's a treble cut this time. So this implements the exact reverse filtering as this one. This again contributes to the analog delay's interesting character. Now, back to our original problem. And the dry signal is louder when you actually have the pedal off. In my perfect dream world, I like it the pedal to actually give it a little bit of boost during solos. So how can we achieve that? We could increase the gain of this circuit. It's fairly easy to do. Change the feedback resistor here and we can get something that maybe we'd want. However, if you do that, then the chances of this delay circuitry being overwhelmed by too much level goes up. Maybe that's not such a good idea. So the other thing that we can do is change the gain of this circuit by changing this feedback resistor right here. Unfortunately, if we were to do that, then the exact frequency response of this shelving filter would change, and that would change the tone of the pedal. Maybe we don't want to do that. This brings us to this resistor right here. For example, if we took this 47K resistor and replaced it with a 22K resistor, then the dry signal would be amplified twice as much as it was before, leaving the affected signal the way it was. It seems that this resistor is our best candidate for changing to get what we want in the pedal. So that is resistor R31. Looking around for R31, we find out that the resistors are not labeled with their component numbers. They just have component values. Now there's several 47K resistors. In fact, there's five of them. Which one is it? Well, that's tricky. But if you look over here, this 47K resistor attaches on one leg to pin six of our op amp, and on the other leg to pin one of our op amp. Pin one is right there, pin six is right here. So looking at how the board is laid out, my money is on this resistor right here, because I could just imagine that this pin is being connected with the trace to pin one here, and this pin being connected with the trace to pin six there. In order to know for sure, we have to go to the board with our multimeter and check the connectivity between this pin, and this pin, and this pin, and this pin. This is a technique we call beeping out. So we have the pedal open on the bench, and the 47K resistor in question, it's that one right there. So, let's beep it out and see if it's the one we expect it to be. Why it's called beeping out is because you can set your ohm meter so that it beeps when it has connectivity, like this. So now, when we dive inside the pedal, we can figure out whether or not this resistor is connected as we expect. So just putting one end of the probe on pin one of the op amp, and the other one on the resistor. That's a good sign. Repeating for pin six of the op amp and the other leg of the resistor. Looks like we found the resistor. So in my perfect world, 
I would like to have that with a variable resistor on it so that I can change it. But I don't want to spend money or drill holes or do anything crazy until I make sure that the thing actually works. So what my plan is, is to put a potentiometer in parallel with that resistor so I can just lower it just a little bit and see if it increases the gain. Going through my big stash of potentiometers here looking for a suitable one, I decide it'd be nice if I could use 100K. So that way when it's all the way up, it shouldn't change the resistance of the 47K too, too much. And I managed to find this one. It's a bit big. Plan is, is I'm gonna wire them with some fairly long leads, have them sitting outside the pedal so it doesn't rattle around inside there, and um, see if it works. Okay, I've got my potentiometer very carefully soldered across that 47K resistor. Let's see what happens. So that actually went fairly well. So given the potentiometer, I could increase the gain of the clean side of the effects pedal and then adjust that with the level of the affected side. I ended up with an overall boost. Um, I measured the um, combined impedance of the resistor and the potentiometer, ended up being around 27K. So if I wanted to, I could pop that 47K resistor out there replace it with a 27K, and then I'd have an overall boost that would last essentially forever. Or I could install a potentiometer in it, drill a hole somewhere in the top of the enclosure, and put the pot in. What do you guys think you should do? Leave a comment below and let me know. In the meantime, thanks for watching Mayfly on the Bench.